there are three big parts of what it means to be a man in our society. And those things are like money, sex and violence. And I think boys grow up seeing that. I see what's on the news and on social media about young boys and their fascination with Andrew Tate. And I went in and I asked the boys, what are you struggling with? Number one, we're not socialised to like be emotional and talk about how we're feeling about anything. That's the world that we're trying to move towards with young people where they are in control of their own internal world. They understand why they think what they think or why they feel how they feel and they can communicate that. They're able to move through the world without causing harm to themselves and without causing harm to other people, which is an ideal way to live life. Welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking and less stress. Creating dating lives sex lives and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome, 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 welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers, and today we have a energetic and wonderful conversation with uh, Ben Hurst, a man who is head of facilitation at, at Beyond Equality. It's an organisation that really is about talking about, you know, gender equality, equality, uh, men's experiences and so forth. And as he talks about in the, the podcast, he goes into schools, goes into workplaces, um, universities and sports teams talking about and creating spaces for men and boys to talk about whatever's important to them, actually, whether that's gender, whether that's um, masculinity, masculinities, as he prefers to, as he, as he says, and really allowing men to explore these areas. And we really dive into that today, um, particularly talking about really exploring masculinities, the different masculinities, um, how we come to the ideas we have about masculinity, um, how we can start to unpack some of those, you know, how we can have conversations with ourselves and also other people about that, how we can create um, spaces for men to explore that, how we can help young boys raise, help boys become better men um, without making them feel shamed and wrong and bad. We talk a lot about the struggles that um, young boys have and what's important to them as well. And we also talk about teachers and the work that um, Ben and Ben's organization does, well, the organization that Ben is part of, does with teachers and helping them unpack some of the, the stuff there, supporting teachers. And we talk about shame. Um, we talk about men who are victims of, of domestic violence and rape, actually, and how they're ignored and why that is. And we dive into... Um, class and the link between kind of class and masculinity and the different masculinities that exist in different classes and, and and so forth. And we also kind of look at what's the next, if we're no longer having to like provide for our partners or in relationship often, you know, men seem providers, what is the next battle for men to take on? And we, we touch upon that towards the end of the episode. And that's a really important part actually, because I think it, um, talks into my work and the work that he does and what we we really saw as the next evolution for for men um to to help raise consciousness raise awareness in the world and, and help raising boys young people and making the world safer for all people including men including women including people of other genders as well and i love this conversation yeah i really really enjoyed this um talking to ben because it just flows so easily so naturally and he has so many wonderful ideas and you can tell he's a man of so much experience um and he also talks about his own ex his own journey to do the work he does now which is as always has many tangents and weaves and ducks and dives as well 
this is the sort of episode, I know I said this last week, but I'm saying again, sort of episode that you may listen to and then want to listen to it with somebody else. That might be, if you have children, it might be your partner. If your partner's a teacher, it might be with their partner as well, or it might be with your kids. You know, you might want to sit down with your teenage boys and listen to this episode because there's some really important nuggets in here. And that might help create some conversations um, and understanding for both you and both them as well and help you have important conversations, discussions about many of the topics that we discuss. But I'm going to stop there. I'll let you jump into the episode. Welcome back, listeners. And today I have another fantastic episode. And we're going to talk about Actually, I don't know what to talk about because we haven't started yet. So <laughs> <laughs> I have a guest with me, a man who it feels like we've been not treading simultaneous paths, but the number of times that people would mention him to me and be like, hey, do you know this guy? And I'm like, yeah, I know this guy. I listened to a couple of podcasts he did and I follow on Instagram. And we hadn't actually crossed paths, whether that's like in real life or in the digital online Zoom video world um, until a few weeks ago well a bit longer than that maybe almost a couple of months ago time flies Mm -hmm. where we were both on a panel talk for for Lilo talking about men and sex you know a topic that I've talked about on this podcast many many times um but today likely to maybe touch upon that but some other things and he does all sorts of weird and wonderful things of his life um which we'll get into as well not so much not much weird but just lots of wonderful things (laughs) I was Um, like "Mm." (laughs) and maybe there's something I don't know (laughs) um but today I have with me Ben Hurst how are you doing yo I'm good man I'm good thank you for having me this feels like a real um honor and privilege to be invited into the space um and i am what was the question how am i doing i'm good i think i'm good yeah i think i'm chill um it's raining which is weird because it's Mm. the weather is like doing summer winter summer spring summer autumn all of the seasons in one season so um you never really know how to dress but other than that i'm pretty relaxed i'm feeling pretty level today which is good (laughs) <laughs> yeah i was looking out <clears throat> just to to my right is my window and i look up i i left that i went for a walk this morning and it was you know gray and cloudy as you expect here in the uk mm-hmm. and i thought oh this is today's okay this could be a day a good day for a run i was like it's a good day for a run and i thought i'll, I'll knock out a couple meetings i got this podcast another podcast earlier and i thought maybe i'll go for a run afterwards and i looked out about an hour ago i was like it's raining it's doing that thing it does yeah. here and now I don't want to go outside. Yeah, it's not running. It's, this is not, I mean, unless it's hot, then it's nice maybe to run in the rain, but this is getting drenched with it. It's that thin rain as well. The rain mm. that's deceptively wet. Do you know what I yeah. mean? Like it, it really gets you without you realising. Anyway, sorry, we didn't come here to talk about the weather. I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> What's good. going I'm on? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Just getting to grips with, uh, as some uh, regulars know, with uh, all the things that are needed for for a baby to arrive and all the things that you yeah, think you're going to need that everyone tells me that you don't actually need, but you still feel compelled to buy. <laughs> Everything. How many buggies do you have? Have you got one? Just one. At the moment, just one. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, yeah. You're doing a good job. Bug- From yeah, what I've heard. The, <laughs> <laughs> the buggy has... Um, you can have a carry cot for it. You can put the car seat in it. And at the moment, that's all we, we've, we, we, we're we going to mess about with. Right. Good way. Good way of doing it. Keep it minimalistic. Yeah. Yeah. As much as you can. But, pay for the baby talk, pay for the weather. So you, I'm not going to tell the listeners what you do. I love to hear mm. how people describe oh. what they do. And I know you don't like saying what you do, but <laughs> I'm still going to ask <laughs> you. Introductions. But, yeah, no. but I also want to know, what was your journey to do what you do? Because things aren't always as straightforward as they seem, I know, in life. Mm. Um, so my what I do, I guess for, for all in, is, it, is the phrase all intents and purposes or all intensive purposes? All intents and purposes. Purpose. Um, mm. I am, so I work as the director of facilitation um, at an organisation called Beyond Equality, which was previously the Good Lad Initiative, which was previously the Great Initiative. So lots of names. We're in a bit of a perpetual branding crisis. But essentially what we do as an organisation is we speak to men across kind of all of the spaces where they can't run away. So like schools, universities, corporate, sports teams, anywhere where they ha- they go and they have to stay there for the whole three hours. Um, we'll like chat to them in those kinds of spaces. But it's like a... Um, 
deconstruction and a reconstruction of masculinity where the participants kind of do it for themselves. Um, so we're not like an organisation who believes that we necessarily have the answer to all of this stuff. We have like a pretty clear framework, which is maybe most easily dis described as like intersectional feminism, but um, really just giving guys the opportunities and the spaces to have conversations about masculinity and gender that maybe they've never had before. Um, and I know for me, like the first time I turned up at this organisation, it was probably one of the first times I'd ever had this conversation. Um, and I, why did I turn up here is a good question. Oh, so I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I grew up with my mum and my dad and three older sisters. Um, I was like in a churchy kind of family. My mum went to church, but my dad didn't go to church. So it was kind of like, mm he would like cook on Sunday mornings. And I think he went to church before I was born with the rest of them and then stopped when I was born, maybe. Maybe that was when he realised it wasn't real. I don't know. Um, anyway, he um, we went to church as a family um, and I grew up around like Christianity and Christian faith. And when I was probably about, I mean, as a kid, I kind of always just thought, we went to like an evangelical Pentecostal but charismatic church. So it's like, imagine Pentecostal church, but like a white version of it, but still everybody there is black. Like, mm. so white pastors, black congregation. Um, and I think for me, spirituality was always like a really big part of my life growing up, but it was kind of a thing that I just thought I would inherit or adopt when I was a bit older. Um, and so we had like a really, really good youth group when I was in church, shout out Blueprint Youth. It was, that was one of the best places I've ever been. But um, we did like loads of creative stuff, loads of art stuff, um, and when I was 15, I went to a summer camp where we had this, like, it was like a very weird, uh, oh, shit, sorry, someone's been, hold on. Can you hear that? You must be able mm. to hear that. I can hear it loud. Okay. Um, yeah, when I was 15, I should going to do the other one. Let me just close the window. Sorry. Better? Better. Um, so, yeah, when I was 15, we went to this summer camp and it was a really weird spiritual experience where, like, I'd gone with all of my friends and it was chill and then all of the, like, stuff that we grew up watching happen to our parents started happening in the room. And I think for lots of us, it was, like, a real moment where our faith kind of became our own faith um, and we really started to take it seriously for ourselves. So it didn't feel like I was going to church because my mum was making me go to church. It was like, I wanted to do that. Um, and then I decided like really soon after that I wanted to go into like full-time ministry when I was an adult and like pastor and look after people in churches and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so I went and did a degree in actually my first almost degree was in youth and community development, but I got like a year in and I was like, this is not, the spice of life, man. It, I wasn't enjoying it. I knew I wanted to work with young people, but um, I just found it really boring. I don't think education ever really suited me as a, as a young person. Um, and then I dropped out. I went back and I went to a seminary and did a degree in theology. So I was like planning, studying, preparing to be a pastor. Um, and then I got kicked out in my last year because I had sex, which you're not supposed to do if you're going to be a pastor, um, unless you're married, which I found out they take really seriously. So anybody who's trying to be a pastor, maybe don't do that unless you're married. Um, but yeah, it was a, it was a, that was a pretty intense experience. And I remember coming home and like my mum didn't chat to me for a while. And it was just weird, man. It was just a weird time. Um, and actually, I always talk about it in jest, but like on a serious level, I think that was probably the start of my own journey with like mental health and I think especially like 10-15 years ago the language for mental health and like mental well-being wasn't around in the same way it is now so it kind of just felt like I, I was probably then what I would now describe as depressed but like nobody knew what depression was and nobody spoke about it um, and so it was quite like yeah a, a weirdly isolating time um, and then I got a job so I got a job as a cover teacher. Two of my sisters were teachers in secondary schools and they were like, you'll love it. You'll really enjoy it. Just do it. Um, but I didn't want to study anymore. So I got a job as a cover teacher to kind of like feel it out. Um, and I did that for two years until I started to absolutely hate kids, man. I couldn't, honestly. I don't know if you've ever taught or been a teacher or like worked in schools in that way, but the staff room is like a, 
oppressive environment <laughs> and and my sisters told me when I went in to like go in hard and it would be really easy so I basically just acted like a psycho like was like being just a weirdo like not talking being really stern, just not like relating to kids in the way that I like to relate to young people um and so I did that for a couple of years until I like really got bored and then I realized it was time to move on so I went to a Charity. So at that time, I was probably still grappling a bit with my faith and like, I'd, I think I'd been kicked out as strong, but like kind of moved away from church and gone to start going to another church um, and was trying to like figure all of that stuff out and still wanted to hold like faith quite tightly. And so I got a job for a Christian relationships and sex education charity, um, which was like on paper the perfect job because like I, I knew about sex because I'd had it but also like I knew about Christianity because I'd studied it and so like it kind of fit and it was like going to schools and talking to young people about like RSE and like sex being best within committed faithful relationships which I could get behind um, and but I, I just didn't vibe with the environment like my boss didn't really like me at the time I don't think I was probably an arsehole I can't really remember but my <laughs> boss didn't vibe with me um and yeah it wasn't it wasn't the right place for me so part of my job there was to develop a boys project about becoming a good man um, and when I was applying for it I was like super easy like I know how to do this I've been doing this for years blah blah blah, blah. and I sat down on my first day or maybe my third day after I'd like filled out all the forms and stuff and I was like oh yeah this would be super easy and then I realized like what is it that like, what are we talking about if if you're talking about teaching boys to become good men like what is a good man first of all and then secondly how do you convince someone that they should be that um mm. and so i think within the christian framework still i had like pretty set ideas around like gender and socialization and norms and what men were supposed to be like um and some of that really resonated with me. Some of it really didn't resonate with me at all. Um, and then I started researching other people who'd done similar work. So there were loads of organisations across the UK that were speaking about, like, taking boys into the woods and teaching them to, like, chop down trees and lay bricks and build houses, which is all good stuff. Um, but I grew up with sisters, and so I was playing with, like, hand-me-down Barbies and painting my nails and stuff. Do you know what I mean? It just wasn't... I was an artsy kid, so that, again, that just wasn't really my vibe. Um, but there were, I wasn't finding anything that really, like, resonate or hit home with me. Um, and then I came across some, like, TED Talks. I think it was, like, Jackson Katz and Tony Porter who were talking about, like, ideas around the collective socialisation of men and gender-based violence. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, and then I went on a training course... Um, which was actually really cool. Like it was this course called Gender Reconciliation um, and it was based on like a lot of the race reconciliation work that had happened in South Africa over the last however many years. Um, and so they took those principles and applied them to like conversations around gender. And that was probably the first time I'd like sat in a room with other people and realised like this, the rabbit hole goes a lot deeper than I thought it did and like really struggled to talk about what my experiences of masculinity had been or like why I thought the things that I thought or why other people thought the things that they thought. And that was like a really cool course. And then I found The Great Initiative and I sent them an email and was like, oh, can you share resources? Like we can do a swap. And they were like, if you come to the train, you can have everything for free. Um, so I turned up on my first day purely like to steal resources. I was just trying to get the stuff and go. Um, but I think that for me was really the first time I'd been in a room that was just full of men. Who, uh, there was mm -hmm. one woman who was co-running the training, but like a room full of men where guys were like beyond like theory and ideas and ideologies, like really talking about their own experiences. And I think it was the first time I'd like spoken to guys where there were other guys who had, who had identified that they'd struggled with their own mental health or like uh, spoke about sexuality openly or spoke about their relationships with their dads and all of that kind of stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is where I'm supposed to be. So I started volunteering um, and then I did that for about a year and then I got a job there and I've been here now for eight years. Sorry, longest introduction of all time, but um, that's why I hate doing them. But um, a really, like, actually like, reflecting on it, quite an interesting journey. I mean, the path's not linear. Do you know what I mean? It's never a, like a linear pathway. It's always like random things take you to random places. Um, but for me, I think the journey has just been sticking around with things that like feel right that feel like mm. they speak to my own experience and give me tools to ex like share that experience with other people um 
And so, yeah, I'd started as a volunteer in schools. Then I got a job running a project, but I'm scatterbrained, so I'm terrible at project management. I should never do project management, ever. Um, but I did that for a couple of years, and then my role has changed and shifted since I've been here. Um, but yeah, I've been here for eight years now, going on nine years. So um, doing cool work, having cool conversations, it's taken me to loads of different places. I've met loads of really interesting people. Um, but mostly, I think it's just... There is a, like, I, I, the, I see the work we do as being like an entry point to this conversation. I think there's like loads beyond the conversations that we have as an organisation. But I think it's like being really skilled in making sure that the first time men have this conversation, it's not like scary or intimidating mm. or anxiety inducing or too much or like too confronting, but also like it's honest and it's real and it feels down to earth and it feels relatable. And there are things where you're like, oh yeah, that is my experience. Or, oh my gosh, I never thought about that before. Um, so just trying to like craft and curate those spaces for guys to kind of connect and have those kinds of conversations. Mm, mm, spaces where men can... Because I've what I've noticed around the topic of kind of masculinity and being a man, a lot of men want to avoid the mm. conversation for numerous reasons. The ones that kind of come to me are they're afraid of you know it's going to paint them as bad. Um, they're going to yeah. have to reveal these mistakes they've made. Someone's going to like tell them off. They're going to be shamed. They're going to be blamed for just being being a man. So they they hire they kind of remove themselves away from it, or they won't go near it. And and. It sounds mm. like from what you're saying here, the this, this skill in these conversations and bringing men together is creating a space where it's like, actually, you can express what it's like to be you. And the people yeah. who say, hey, I, I feel that way or I've had that experience, that allows for like an unfolding of men to kind of open up more and more and to explore topics that could be a little bit difficult to 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 kind of digest and go through. But because the, the, sa the space feels safe for them to do so, they they lean into that more and more. Yeah, man. I think, uh, yeah, it's it's about that space for, like, ultimately just reflection. Do you know what I mean? Just thinking. And I think the, the thing that's difficult for men, especially around conversations when it comes to gender, is, like, number one, we're not socialised to, like, be emotional and talk about how we're feeling about anything, really, other than maybe sports. Um, but also, there is, like, a real uh, lack of language like it's like we even when we get into the conversation we don't really know what we're supposed to say or like what the right thing is or and it feels like there's a right and wrong um and i think that point that you made about men feeling like they're being blamed is like super accurate like the most common thing we hear probably in the last two years and um, especially around like all the andrew tate stuff is like oh we're not allowed to say anything anymore which is weird because mm. we literally invite them into spaces where they can say whatever they want but like <laughs> they like they feel so self they feel so censored that they self-censor and then they yeah. just don't like yeah or we like don't want to we don't feel safe or comfortable and then you add into that like the mix of like how much we judge each other and how much we hold each other to those standards and like trying to fit in and trying to be cool and all of that kind of stuff i think it's just it's complicated there's a lot of moving pieces that need mm. to be thought about in order to like smoothly trans transition people through those conversations um mm. so yeah we we i guess if we're experts in anything we're probably experts in that like moving men through those conversations in ways that don't feel horrible like ways that don't make them feel like they don't want to do it again you know mm. um and like trying to create a space where they'll be able to continue doing that after they finish their time with us i think is yeah what's important mm. Mm. and then you do the same with with young men with young boys mm. in, mm -hmm. in schools and i had a little experience with this I, I spent some time in a couple of schools last last summer like going in and talking to the young boys mainly but sometimes i'll speak in the sessions with young girls and I, and I see what I saw was my experiences. Like, first of all, before I went into the school, it's like, you know, I see what's on the news and on social media about young boys and their fascination with Andrew yeah. Tate and blah, blah, blah. And I went in and I, I kind of asked the boys, like, what's it like being you? What are you struggling with? And I found that really interesting because when I spoke to the teachers beforehand, that was something that I identified that no one really seemed to be, everyone was telling me, saying what they are and what they're doing and what they like and what they need to do. Um, yeah. So I wonder from, from your perspective and from your experience, what are young boys struggling with? 
I mean, probably the same shit that we were struggling with when we were young boys. Do you know what I mean? I, this is the thing that's interesting is I don't think it changes. Honestly, I think it's always the same stuff. It's always like um, issues around identity, issues around violence, issues around sex and sexuality. Um, I think the natural path of like being a teenager, which is a weird thing to say, but like the way that brains develop, there are loads of things around like risk-taking behaviour and like forming boundaries and learning peer, peer-to-peer relationships and all of those kinds of things. So I think it's like always the big topics of like friendship, relationships, um, family, trying to differentiate from caregivers, like wanting to form their own opinions, wanting to figure out where the boundaries are, how far you can push things, um, developing like a sense of humour, learning how to be funny, um, developing intelligence, like learning the world around you, becoming more aware, developing empathy, a massive part of it. Um, mm. And I think they, the interesting thing is that when you ask them, they never, they never like verbalise it in that way. They're not using those yes. terms. Do you know what I mean? Mm. They're like, uh, we want to know how to chat to girls or like, we want to yeah. know like, oh, why is everybody, why are there so many genders or like blah, blah, blah. And it's always quite antagonistic, which is my favourite mm. thing about young people. Like often um, <laughs> they're trying to like piss you off or like rattle your cage a little bit but I do think that there's a the part of that is just the way that their brains are developing and there's also a beauty in it because I think they're so honest and unfiltered um mm. which is different that's a big difference when you get to like talking to men there's so many layers to unpack with adult men whereas with boys they kind of just give it to you all straight in the first 10 minutes because they think they're being hilarious and then you're like oh that's so interesting why do you think now where does that come from um but yeah I think it's all of like all of the relational stuff Um, And then I think the other thing we forget about young people, especially when we're working in schools, is that lots of these young people are dealing with like real, like serious real life stuff. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like I think in my mind, when I think of young people, I'm always like, oh, being young is like easy and it's chill. Whereas like loads of young people are dealing with like coming from uh, domestic violence backgrounds or dealing with like serious uh, health or mental health issues or dealing with like care and responsibilities or there's a whole plethora of like other things that are kind of just beneath the surface um, mm. that like schools might know on their safeguarding sheets but like nobody ever really talks about um, and so I think for those young people they often feel like there's no space for them to really open up and express that kind of stuff so we get like quite a lot of that kind of stuff coming out in sessions as well um where like it's their first opportunity to really talk so they tell you everything um we were doing some sessions at a technical college the other day um was it in Southampton maybe in Southampton and the kids were talking about a lot of the kids were talking about like coming from families where uh their parents had served in the British Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Um, And therefore, like, a lot of the conversations that they were having around masculinity were so tied to that identity Mm. and, like, that feeling of needing to serve your country and that's how you prove your worth and your value and you, like, get uh, affirmation from your family. and And which is just, like, a conversation that I would never... I would never walk into a classroom and be like, let's talk about joining the army. But, like, it is... Like, they're dealing with, like, a whole range of stuff. So, like, loads of things that are... Um, yeah, difficult. And it's easy to forget, do you know what I mean? Like, what it's like to be a teenager. When you're dealing with all of those things, plus your body's changing and puberty and, like, emotions and, like, just all of the stuff. Um, it's, like, a, a a pretty intense time. So we try to, like, yeah, give them a little bit of respite, but also, like, challenge them and push them a little bit and get them to, like, really think about why they are forming the opinions they're forming and where they're forming from. Um, but I think that's the real crux of it is like, regardless of what's going on for them, it's helping them to understand that like, if they view it critically, like they are the the people who are steering the ship. Do you know what I mean? They're the, like the masters of their own destiny to some extent and they are consuming stuff and experiencing stuff and how they make sense of it is what matters rather than what it is. Um, that's going on around so yeah loads of conversations sorry jumbled answer but loads of stuff no, that's coming up for no, no. It, <clears throat> like I, I saw I saw a lot of what you said actually in my experience and I was in a school in West London and mm. it was in a very affluent part of West London but then it had a real like mix up mix up of people from different backgrounds <laughs> and yeah. it was really blew me because you know there was kids in there who were refugees you know, there was, yeah. there was kids I met who both their parents had been killed in war and they yeah. had been adopted over here. And your 
I was there and I remember just standing in front of me, you see all of them, you're like, wow, this experience, I'm an adult. So, you know, this, the concept of trauma and wounding and all these things, I now have an understanding. Mm. You don't understand what's happened to you and how that's affected no you. Idea. Like, like the fact that yeah. your dad, you've never seen your dad because you know, your dad died when you were two, three years old. You've never had a man who mm. has been kind and compassionate to you or you come from poverty, you know, poverty being something I saw a lot of the kids, a lot of the boys especially grappling with. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it seemed, the poverty seemed to really, and I say poverty, I don't mean in any ne negative sense because I would say in many ways I grew up in poverty. And, but how that infuses so deeply into their view of masculinity and what it means to be a man. Yeah like money, like, uh, you know, there were kind of 12 year old boys. And when I said, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And they were just like, I just want to be rich. Mm. That's it. Nothing else. I'm like, well, why do you want to be rich? So then I can do whatever I want. And this is something that I guess we don't always think when we think of like young boys and young men is like, we show them from a young age, like money is, is the most important thing for them to be, to have, to give them freedom yeah. and to help them have the things they want. Yeah, I, but I, I heard, um, I think it was like uh, Richie Reseda. I don't know if you know who, who he is, but he's like a dude that was in LA and was arrested and went to prison and started this like prison feminism project while he was in there and like had loads of these types of conversations with men. Um, and he bases a lot of his work on like uh, the writings of like Bell Hooks and Angela Davis and blah, blah, blah. blah. I don't really read books, but like I do listen to, people talk and those are interesting people um but i think there was a I, I remember seeing a video of him where he broke it down in a way where he was like there are three big parts like three big components of what it means to be a man in our society and those things are like money sex and uh violence which kind of mm -hmm. boils down to power um yeah and that's like the and i and we see it all the time do you know what i mean like in young people yeah your what that observation you made is so accurate that like if you never chat to boys, like you will be shocked how many of them are like absolutely obsessed with like finance and money oh, and yeah. sta stability and security. And I know sometimes that has a negative connotation to it, but I think also there's a reality that like we, we don't receive very good financial education in this country and financially, mm -hmm. like the way that capitalism works in the UK um, and in loads of other places in the world, there's like a, a vast majority of people who just don't really have enough. And there's a, mm. a tiny minority of people who have everything. Um, and I think boys grow up seeing that. And they know, like, do you know what I mean? They're, they're aware. They might not have the language to put to it, but they know what's happening. Um, and so that becomes a big determining factor of like how they view or value their success or their failure as a man um, and how they view other people around them. Um, which is tough. I mean, the whole thing, just like my overwhelming feeling, especially when I'm talking to boys, is just that it's a lot of pressure. Do you know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's a lot of pressure for what are essentially children to, to like bear in terms of like thinking about what the future holds and who they need to be. And there's a lot of like external standards that in lots of cases are not linked to who they are as people or what they want for themselves. Like wanting to be rich is not like a, a real thing. Do you know what I mean, obviously it is, mm. but like there are so many different ways of making money. There are so many different ways of like finding financial security or financial stability. Um, and like maybe thinking about some of those things can help. Like what, what is it that you like doing? What, how do you want to make money? What kinds of mm. things do you want to do? Um, I think those are the kinds of conversations that for lots of young people are just missing. Um, mm. And they are searching out. They're searching Aunt, for answers do you know what I mean I think that's the other thing that we miss is that they're looking everywhere and trying to find the solutions for themselves because the solutions aren't being handed to them um and I know there's like loads of uh work on rites of passage um which I've always found like a little bit icky like for, for me on a personal level like I've never like, the idea of like rites of passage has never really resonated with me in that in that sense but I I think I've come to understand that actually that process of like initiating 
boys into manhood and giving them options and like purpose and like things that they should aspire to is really important. Um, mm. And where they're not being provided with that, like through education or in society, they're looking for it in other places and trying to find it. And I think then it boils down to like those three things, money, sex, power is where you find your validation as a man. Um, so lots of them are like very, very focused on solving those problems for themselves. Um, but before they've even had their first paper round, <laughs> I mean, before they're yeah. not even like, do people even do paper rounds anymore? But like, they're, they're not <laughs> at an age where they're legally allowed to work. Do you know what I mean? So it's weird that, that that's what their fixation is. Um, but also completely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And I, <clears throat> I'm going to say with my experience, because they were so obsessive with, with money. And I spent one of the schools I went in there, I was there. I did a total of, eight or nine days running workshops with, mm. with boys from year seven to your year 10. And the other thing that was really important to them, I guess it comes in power was respect. It was a really, really important yeah. component. Like the word they use respect, they I literally wouldn't go a, an hour session with them without using the word respect. Yeah. And I found it really fascinating <clears throat> in the ways that I would, they would talk to me about respect and I would ask them what respect was. And then they would go and do things. And I'd just say to them, like, does this, is this respectful? Should I respect you? <laughs> like, do you see yeah. how you're behaving and you want me to respect yeah. you, but do you see how you behave? So should I respect you? Yeah. If you, if I was doing what you were doing, would you respect me? And it's, it's really interesting that this idea of respect is so, it's not interesting because I see it in grown men. I've seen it in grown men on the road and it's like, all they have is respect. And when you have nothing, when you have nothing, your mm. respect and your honor of all you have and your defendant of your life, right? That's something that's really clear. Mm. Um, and the, the way that their minds would work, I found really fascinating. But what I also found really fascinating was that, and I'm, I, I'm interested to see what your thoughts on this, is that young boys can be reasoned with if you're willing to mm. kind of listen to them and you're willing to like yeah. ask them and be curious about their experience and what their fears, worries, anxieties and stresses are and, and their desires. A hundred percent. I think that the the idea of like respect is... Another one of those areas where like the concepts of like respect and disrespect um, feel like places where we've not been given the language to articulate what it is that we mean. So mm. those are the words that we've heard. And so those are the words that we use when actually like when we're talking about respect, I think especially for boys, like we have these conversations about like what the in, a, in an ideal world or like if we took a snapshot of your school, what would the archetype of a popular boy look like? and respect mm. is a word that comes up a lot in there right um but i think actually what they're really talking about is like somebody who's intimidating somebody who's feared mm. somebody who no one will mess with somebody who has status somebody who gets what they want some and those are not not, not those things are not e intrinsically linked to the feeling of being respected or the feeling of giving respect right um and even for myself like it's not even about just about boys because i i know like in therapy i spent low like maybe three or four months like going through this cycle of like turning up to therapy and being like i feel like i've been disrespected and then when we drill down to what the feeling is maybe the feeling is like humiliation or embarrassment mm -hmm. or frustration or upset um, and the only word I have to describe all of those things is just disrespect. So I think um, when you speak about like them being able to be reasoned with, I think actually for me, that's what the whole process of reasoning is. Do you know what I mean? Is like figuring out what the emotions are that sit beneath the words that we're using to describe them. So like when kids are saying, I just want to be respected, like what does that look like? What does that feel like for you? Like, how, how would you know that you are being respected? All of those things. And like, can we cultivate that in this room with these other people? Or is there a way of like getting that? Is there a reason that you'd give that to some people and wouldn't give that to other people? All of those kinds of questions that just like help them to start processing, maybe in slightly different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you move them into that space, um, one of the things I noticed when I was working in education was that it's so punitive. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It's so like, um, like as a teacher, I remember I never had any training in like how to navigate when I feel disrespected by young people. So then mm. the way that I would navigate feeling disrespected by young people was to disrespect them, like to take it even further. And ultimately I had power so I could get away with doing whatever I wanted and they didn't. So they would have to submit to whatever it was I was subjecting them to. Um, but I remember like, one time I was covering a drama lesson and I made this kid cry because I just kept 
asking like cutting questions and it was horrible like in hindsight like that was a really horrible thing to do as a grown adult to like a child um but I think actually like giving them the tools to think about like how they can get maybe some of the things that they want but also why they want those things like why do we want to be feared like what's the what does that give us well it means that no one's gonna trouble me or no one's going to try and take my things or no one's going to try and make me look stupid and if that's the thing that is, is what really matters like if the thing is that we don't want to be made to look stupid maybe there's another way of like achieving that without having to be feared by everybody maybe instead of replicating that system that's so punitive we can like create something different for ourselves but I think it's all about like possibility do you know what I mean and especially when it comes to that reasoning point it's not about um manipulating them into doing what we want them to do it's more about like opening up the possibilities of what else can exist outside of the natural consequences of the behaviors that they're taking at the time um but i think i like i always feel sad for teachers because i just think all of these these things like when i think about the ways that we work and the ways that we practice um the, the one thing that we're afforded is like time and even though it's not a lot of time like we have a two-hour session where the objective is just to talk about this so mm. i'm not trying to teach them maths at the same time <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm not trying to teach them geography whilst having conversations about reasoning and thinking about why we do the things we do so i think people are just stretched for time and i know for a lot of parents as well they feel that strain like the tension um of like trying to do the things that we know are the right ways to relate to people, the ways that we'd want to be related to, but also trying to keep someone safe and trying to get someone to bed on time and trying to get someone fed and doing... Like, I'm watching my sister trying to do ger gentle parenting at the moment, and it is different. <laughs> it's a different way of approaching a relationship with a child. But in lots of ways, it's so healthy because they learn their own boundaries and they learn their mm. own like when they feel safe and when they don't feel safe and when they're hungry and they can identify it and they can ask for things themselves rather than just being told the ways the right ways to behave and I think yeah in the same way that's the the world that we're trying to move towards with young people where that like they are in control of their own internal worlds do you know what I mean like they mm. they understand why they think what they think or why they feel how they feel and they can communicate that it doesn't mean that things always go the way they want them to go but it does mean that like they're able to move through the world without causing harm to themselves and without causing harm to other people which is fingers crossed an ideal way to live life you know yeah and it sounds like what you're, I mean, you say there is like, it's teaching kids to be able to kind of critically think and think for themselves and make choices mm. and decisions for themselves. And the only issue is that schooling and the way our schools are kind of structured in the UK, especially is like really, like you said, the teachers, what they're there to do is to teach them this thing and tell them the thing that they're going through is right. And in mm. your sessions, it's like there's a lot of exploration of ideas and thoughts and how we've come to these thoughts and how we could think differently and how we could act differently. But then teachers who are teaching the regular curriculum, it's really, this is what you need to know. This is what you need to learn. And this is how we do it. There's this, yeah. there's this almost, um, kind of rubbing up of generations. Like there's a new generation of teaching that we're seeing and education where if we teach children to, advocate for themselves, understand how they feel, their own desires and their own wants and be able to express that, then they'll be powerful individuals in their lives and they will, as you say, do less harm to themselves and others. But then we've got mm. this schooling system, which is basically like, you need to think like this and you need to do these things and memorise these times tables. And they just kind of yeah. like rub up against each other. And I, I, you know, when I went back into school last year and saw this, I was like, oh my God, these teachers are so up against up against it to actually yeah i wouldn't call it teach because it's like educate kids in life but they don't have any time or space because they've got this curriculum that needs to be taught yeah 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 yeah. and there's also like a massive assumption that they've done that education themselves do you mm. know what i mean like there's a there's a big assumption we apply to teachers that they've got all of their shit together um when like, I, I know from, it, actually I can trace it through every element of my adult education. Like when I did my degree, I realized like, oh, there's so much stuff that I've never thought about in regards to like my faith that I, I, I'm saying I want to be in a position to teach other people about this, but I don't know what I think about it. Or when I was teaching sex ed, like 
the expectation is that I'm going to be like a really great role model and tell kids all of these answers and teach them about consent. But nobody ever taught me about consent. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. I don't, I don't remember learning all of this stuff. I didn't know the information. I had to train, like really train and like learn statistics and facts and figures. And there's so much stuff. And I think the same with like masculinity and gender and like ways of being and mental well-being and all of those kinds of things. There's so much that we, um, aspire to like fix in the next generation without ever having fixed in ourselves and fix is mm. like a weird way of talking about it but like like I remember when I started doing this work the thing that made me stay was that we didn't jump straight into how to fix boys and um, mm. the conversation wasn't like oh here's how you go into school and convince boys to be good men the conversation was like Oh, what was your experience of masculinity? Like, what what did you learn from your dad about being a man? Where, why is that important to you? Like, what do you think about being a man now? Like, what would you change if you could change stuff? And I remember thinking, like, I've never thought about these things before. I've mm. never considered what I like and don't like about being a man. I, if somebody asked me, I'd probably just be like, it's hard. And that would be the end of the conversation. But actually, like... I think that reflective space is so, so important. And I, I agree with you. Teachers are like... I mean, the most, probably the most underpaid people, teachers and cleaners, probably mm. the most underpaid people in our society because those are two jobs. And obviously, shout out the NHS and all of the care workers, but like those kinds of jobs where you're like looking after people um, and tasked with like the nurturing of people's brains when maybe nobody's nurtured yours <laughs> in, in mm. the right way, I think is like so, so difficult. Um, but... I also think there is, it feels like maybe as a society we, we're, I mean, the, the change over the last 10 years has been drastic. Do you know what I mean? It feels like we're definitely in a space where people are more conscious of their own role and responsibility and like applying critical thinking to their own lives before teaching other people to apply it to theirs. Um, and so hopefully we carry on moving in that way. And I always think like it's... um really interested in the kind of work that like I see you and other guys doing when it comes to like um uh men's wellness retreats and like all of like these kinds of spaces where we like bring guys in and allow them to like express their emotions and feel all the feelings and like tap into like deep somatic work like I've always been like quite anti that kind of stuff because it's always felt like weird and uncontrollable but I also think there's a level there that's like super important to to reach as as guys where it's like we are in tune with like how we're feeling and what's going on and why why things are the way that we are because once you know that stuff it doesn't even fix everything for you do you know what I mean but once you know it you can at least see why things are happening and you're not like a slave to like all of the things that have just happened in the past um which I think is important so like yeah giving kids spaces to kind of start doing that work for themselves but is always secondary to like giving the people who are teaching those kids the spaces to do that for themselves as well. Um, and so as much as we do like schools work and all that kind of stuff, like teacher training is a really important part of like what mm. we're doing as well and trying to give people that foundation and that grounding in like uh, their own reflection and their own practice for themselves before they're thinking about other people. Mm. So how do you support teachers in, in that? Um so sales pitch no not sales pitch but we do like um uh we have like different teacher training options so we run like seminars and workshops and then longer form pieces of work so maybe a day or like a couple of days where we uh get people around and we just take them through very similar activities to like the same things that we take young people through um where we're getting them to do their own thinking and their own reflection and draw their own conclusions about masculinity so asking them those same questions like what did you learn like where did you get it from how do you feel about it what would you change if you could um what did you like about being a man what didn't you like about being a man what why are those things in place like where do they come from and I think for me the other key component um especially that we do with adults more often than we do with children is really looking at that like socialization piece because I think for lots of people things can feel like they are very accidental or just very natural, like very inherent. Um, and actually all of this is like just humans having a human experience. Yeah, you know I mean, like we're just people experiencing the world. Um, and because of the way that we've constructed the world around us to operate, we have very different experiences dependent on like some of our characteristics. But like 
I don't know if very many of those things are inherent at all. And I think actually, like, maybe giving people the ability to, like, place that and locate it and then make a decision about it kind of frees people in lots of different ways. Do you know what I mean? There are so many men who, like, want to be able to, like, dance or, like, wish that they were allowed to play with dollies when they were kids or wish that they were allowed to paint their nails or wish that they were allowed to, like, sleep with with whoever they wanted to sleep with and maybe in lots of cases do that stuff in, in private and, like, hide it away from other people, which can lead to, like, a lot of, like, repression and... But I, I just feel like maybe we've missed something here. Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe, maybe mm. if that's the way that we all feel like we have to operate in the world maybe we've constructed that world incorrectly around us and there's a way of making it where there's more freedom for everybody to kind of show up as who they are and who they want to be in the world. Um, And yeah, you spoke about poverty earlier. I think there are some big, big, big factors when it comes to like um, poverty and wealth distribution around the world, when it comes to like climate and the impact of a climate crisis, well, like those big wicked problems, do you know what I mean? Like things that like Mm. impact everybody um, and there's no escaping where we've probably, uh, I, I feel like as an organisation, if we solved gender and like there was no more gender-based violence and everything was fine in the world and everybody felt like they were allowed to be who they wanted to be, there would still be big issues to solve. Do you know what I mean? There'd still be like other things that like cause massive pain and strife for people um, that on a systemic level and on a systematic level would need to be like tackled and challenged. So maybe that's the next thing to start thinking about. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll take a break <laughs> after I solve this one. Because it sounds like we, when you're talking about teachers, is is as you said, guiding them to do their own work, but also mm. in there, it sounds like you're helping them unearth their own shame as well that's existed for themselves around you know masculinity and their ideas and so forth, and mm. but also then looking at what we often see is the way it is, the way the world is, the way people are. And starting to see that, oh, these aren't just the way it is. These are things that are le- like taught down silently and yeah. quietly t- and actually going, oh, look, you can put a circle around that almost and go, look, this is how boys are and men are taught to be, but we don't have to be that way. Is that, would that yeah. be a fair assessment? Yeah, that's a perfect assessment. Um, and I think, it, I think it is that, like there's a, um, Tony Porter in his, in his TED talk, which has like been one of the seminal works of my life. I mean, I didn't do it, but like one of the most impactful things I've ever seen, I think, like speaks about the idea of the man box. Yeah. Um, which like, yeah, where, so all of the things that we have to do in society to be considered as a man. Um, and in there, there's things like uh, a certain dominance over women. There's things like not crying or expressing emotion, like being straight, being a protector, being a provider, so on and so forth. And there's loads of things in there like, that are not inherently bad. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. there's loads of parts of like what society says a man should be that are like, if you vibe with that, that's all good. Do you know what I mean? Like that's completely chill. And maybe you do want to be the provider. Maybe you're a really motivated person who wants to go out and like make money and build things and like create spaces and like do all of those things that you view as important. Um, maybe you want to be a, a bodybuilder and be tough and athletic and strong. Um, but there are also loads of guys who like some of those things don't resonate with. Um, and I think that's the first part of a complicated problem is that like masculinity is so prescriptive um, mm. even in the bits that are not harmful that it just causes problems for people. Do you know what I mean? It just means that like we're, we're instantly from like our earliest years grading people on a standard of like how much of a man they really are or like you're a real man and you're not. Or, like, I'm seeing at the moment, like with all of the stuff that's going on with um, uh, Diddy, um, mm. there's loads of like people, social commentators talking about like real men don't do X and Y and Z. Yeah. And then like, the, or not even real men don't, but like, he's not a man, he's a boy because only boys do X and Y and Z and men wouldn't do those things. And I kind of like, my feeling is always that, well, he is a man because being a man is just about being an adult boy, right? Like it's, mm. it's not, in, it's not inherently worthy of celebration or like a good thing. It's just, a, it's just a, a process of development, but like maybe he's not a very good one. Um, maybe he's not a good person. Do you know what I mean? Or maybe he's made some mistakes or maybe he's done something really bad in that element. Um, but actually I think there's another part of that, which is that there are some components of that socialization of men 
um, which are inherently negative. So like the ways that we're taught to view and see women and want to dominate them and want to be in control and want to have power. Um, I think maybe there's not enough analysis of like why those things exist in the ways that they do exist. Um, and generally when you lead people to like those kinds of conversations, they reach good conclusions by themselves. Do you know what I mean? Like most people want to self-actualize. Most people want to consider themselves and be considered as good people. Most people don't want to cause harm to people around them. Most people want to help people around them, want to build communities, all of those kinds of things. Um, but I think it's just, there's a like a bit of cognitive dissonance between how maybe some of those expectations of what it means to be a man don't really match up with those ideals of like who we want to be in the world and how we want to, like the legacies we want to leave behind us. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of it um, is having that, I mean, it's it's a complicated conversation, you know, but like also not that complicated. And generally, um, most people want to have it. So like leading teachers to that, those kinds of conversations before we expect them to start being able to have them really well with young people without replicating any of the problems that they may have experienced in their own lives. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And that bit that you said about the cognitive dissonance, it's like there's I, I was a I worked in software development for a number of years. So mm -hmm. it's like conflicting programming. Right. We've got this programming like I want to be a good human being. I want to be kind and compassionate and so forth. Mm. But I've also got this kind of like hidden programming I'm not aware of of I need to always be in charge. I need to always be dominating. I can never be weak. I can don't let anyone disrespect me. You know, all these things. And they under the hood there's like this conflict and yeah. Often when people will speak, they'll say, oh yeah, I'm a good person. I do these things. And there's these like under the hood values that are causing behaviors that they're almost not fully aware of. Like, you know, I've done this with yeah. men before where you talk about the subtle things that they do. I remember being in a particular company years ago and I was managing someone, but I wasn't managing this person. I was talking about someone else. And I was like, do you realize that you have this habit of talking over people whenever they start speaking, you don't listen. <laughs> and he was like, I, I hadn't realized. He's like, I just get really excited. I was like, I get you get really excited and that's really great. But do you realize that when you do that, other people don't talk and the people who are less likely to talk are people who are used to that happening to them. So they just shrink back. Yeah. People like you will battle for your the, the time. And it's these sorts of behaviors that sometimes as men or people in general, right? That we don't realize that it's even happening. It's just like this under the hood behavior that's programmed into us or we've absorbed from the outside world that plays out that does yeah harm to ourselves and also to other people, but completely unconsciously. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that is um, often the case, especially when we're in workplaces, like something we come across a lot, that there are loads of guys who um, don't see themselves as part of the problem. Do you know what I mean? And I think mm. like there was years ago, there was the, uh, the, hash, the men are trash hashtag mm. on Twitter and like all of those conversations around like, oh, men just, shit and like we hate men and everybody hates men and I think um there was obviously it was like stupid but like I also think there was like a an an element of truth there that like lots of the behaviors that we as men have been socialized into performing um cause harm and we don't even realize because it's not our experience like we're not causing harm to ourselves or to other men um we're causing harm to other people and in lots of cases we're also causing harm to other men but we're also taught to like get up and brush it off um, mm. so like that violence point from before, right? Like, uh, the idea of like, um, one of the things that guys say all the time, like young guys say in workshops is that boys will have a fight and then get over it quick. Whereas girls will like argue and be bitchy and catty for like years. And that's why boys are better than girls. Um, when actually like I, I, I'm always like, but that doesn't it make more sense that if you have an issue with someone, you talk through it and work out what the issue was and try and seek resolution rather than just punch each other. And then after you've punched each other, one person wins and one person loses. The person who's the strongest is the person that's right. But like, maybe they're not. Um, and I always find like those kinds of dynamics very strange that like have existed for really long time, uh, for really long periods of time. So like that same idea of like, um, men being taught that like they, they need to be louder, they need to be stronger, they need to be dominant, they need to be the leaders. Well, we are going to be the people in team meetings who are dominant then. And we are going to be the people in team meetings who are like the loudest and always steal other people's ideas. And we're not doing it because we're being horrible. We're not doing it because um, 
we want to cause harm to other people. We're just doing it because that's the way we've been taught to navigate through the world. Um, but I also think that there is a, uh, that's probably the uncomfortable bit of the conversation, right? There's a level of accountability that we have to take um, as people who have been socialised in that way to decide whether that's the way, once we're aware of it, is that the way we want to continue to to be and to live, right? Um, and I, I can understand, like, I remember the first time I'd had this conversation. I remember being in training and um, I think the question was something like, uh, it's, an, it's a nice thing to tell someone that they're beautiful or sexy or stunning that was the kind of question right and I was like yeah and I remember like being a kid and my sister telling me like us walking to my grand's house and I was like that girl's so pretty and she was like if you were if you ever think a woman's pretty you should always tell her and so I remember like growing up like with that message being affirmed by a woman um, mm. and being taught by a woman it wasn't even taught by a man it was like that's the right way to behave as a man that's a nice thing to do people will always be flattered and they'll always take it well and only as an adult realizing that's not always the case do you know what I mean but and that doesn't mean that I was a bad person it doesn't mean that I was like being horrible or it like being misogynistic on purpose but maybe that was misogyny. <laughs> maybe maybe there was some like fucked up elements or dynamics that were involved there. So I think it's that kind of unpacking that like all of us have got to do in like, not just when it comes to gender and masculinity, but in all the areas of our life. Do you know what I mean? Like there's a, a level of thinking that we've not been um, encouraged to do for ourselves, that mm. we've kind of just been told these are the right things and these are the wrong things. And racism is bullying someone because of the color of their skin. Whereas like racism is like much bigger and much more complex than that. And there's loads of reasons why it happens. And all of us to some extent probably have some kind of internalized racism and like think like have our own values about which dollies are prettier or which cartoon characters are better or like all of those kinds of things that we just never unpack. Um, and I think for men, they fall on the side of that where it's easy to kind of point the finger um, and and attach blame, but I also don't know if um, shame is is a the most efficient tool for transformation. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. I think actually mm. for lots of guys, there's probably other ways that we can have those same conversations that will help them to reach healthier conclusions and um, more efficiently <laughs> and without mm. without causing harm um, to the to their community around them as well. Right? Like I think. Um, looking at all of the stuff that's going on around domestic violence at the moment, like I always think um, in the future, what does our work look like in that kind of sphere, in that kind of space where we're having conversations with men who are perpetrators of like serious domestic violence or men who are victims of serious domestic mm. violence? Because that's also a conversation that we don't really have, you know? Um, and like, why are the reasons that, what are the reasons that we don't have those conversations and how do we like create pathways where, um, those men uh, who have caused that harm can see themselves as like um, men who are capable of love and care and empathy, and but also there's something that's been a blocker to that, and why is that? Um, but I, I know, like in the inception of our organisation, um, this work was started by a bunch of women who like tried to do this work and have these conversations and realised that. It, probably wasn't really their job to, like that actually maybe like this was just long and like there's a lot of harm there's a lot of like bullshit that comes up in the conversations there's a lot of like ignorance and belligerence that gets put across and um actually maybe this work is uh something that men need to take in their own like take responsibility for and like how do we have the, as men how do we have these conversations with the other men in our communities how do we challenge our friends how do we challenge our brothers how do we challenge our dads how do we challenge our sons um to be better healthier versions of themselves for themselves and for other people rather than like always leaving that conversation to women to do leaving that conversation to the people who experience the majority of the harm you know um mm. sorry I'm, I'm i don't even know if i'm making sense anymore but interesting no, conversation no. lots of thoughts yeah, and you know, you touched on there like men who are victims of domestic violence, and I think of like as much as there's this masculinity that's like do harm and cause harm. The flip side of it also is that when men are the victims of harm, mm. there's a silence from them, but also to a certain degree, yeah. societally, we don't see them as victims. Like I'm thinking of the woman who um, raped two of her 
um, students. pupils, students. And yeah. every newspaper and everywhere I saw it was, it was like, woman has sex with students. And I was like, wow, woman has sex with students, really. Because like, if that was a man, it would be like, he'd be, he'd be branded as a monster. Whereas it's almost yeah. like she's just off on some jolly, you know, she's a bit of a horny woman. Yeah. And there's this, and then there's also like victims of male victims of domestic violence. And I've seen some statistics and it's actually much higher than we would ever assume. And also men who are a victim of rape, for instance, as well. And, and so forth. Mm. There's this kind of double edged thing where it's like, we're advocating a lot for ter- like focusing on the men who are doing harm, but, do you think that, and this is a leading question, <laughs> do you think that <laughs> we are kind of ignoring no. the men who are the victims of harm as well because yeah. of the same kind of masculinity, traditional masculinity ideas oh, we yeah. hold and are, are like deeper levels of society? Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, it's a, it's the it's the most uh, vicious double edged sword, <laughs> the most brutal <laughs> double edged sword, um, probably in existence. Where like for lots of men. Um, we grow up with these expectations that we would do harm and we're that's seen as normal so we're almost expected to cause harm to people and no one's surprised when we do but also when we experience harm we're not allowed to ask for help because that's not part of being a man and we're not allowed to Mm. be upset because that's not part of being a man and we're not allowed to uh express weakness or pain because that means that you become a victim again and so like there's so many like layers and i think there's also like um a very different version of this that exists for like women and other versions of it that exists for people of other genders that yes. like is not necessarily our work in the same way um where like often when we go into uh classrooms boys will be like well so what about toxic femininity and i always think like why do you care (laughs) like obviously i know why they care but like Mm. and i get it and i do think toxic femininity is a thing in the same way that masculinity can become corrupted and toxic obviously femininity can become corrupted and toxic and i think if we swapped it but the power dynamic stayed the same so that men were feminine and women were masculine we'd see that like all of those characteristics like being caring and being nurturing and being kind and being gentle can quite easily become like manipulative and coercive control and like all a a whole range of other things but like the reality is that like for us as men like the the outcomes are in the gutter do you know what i mean like in terms of like our own mental health our well-being like poverty homelessness the whole range of issues um that we kind of like don't speak about and then we we get really upset that nobody speaks about them like also mm. do you know what i mean because i think lots of men are also experiencing these things um and so for lots of us we're like oh like it, it's always a conversation about women and helping women and saving women and nobody cares about men but like in the same vein like maybe as men that's our responsibility to take that conversation and carry it forward do you know what i mean because i think actually there are so many parts of like that socialization of what it means to be a man that are just not helpful in like the ways that a, a human can be a happy human being. Do you know what I mean? If you feel like you always have to be strong and you always have to be tough and you always have to be in control, you're probably not going to be a very happy person. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I know that people who work jobs where that's required of them are very drained by their work. Um, and so I imagine for men who live their lives in that way, for men who live their lives where they always have to, um, be in control and they always have to protect and they always have to provide and they can never share any of those responsibilities with community or partners around them like that's draining bro that's like tiring um and i think it means that you you don't get the the opportunity to ask for help so for men i think actually like um and in my own experience like actually it takes a lot of bravery to to be the person that like asks for support and asks for help because often even the first couple of times you do it other people around you don't even know how to handle it do you know what i mean so mm. like when you're i don't know if you uh saw baby reindeer did you watch i haven't that? seen it yet my, my partner watched the whole oh thing oh my told gosh me about yeah so interesting but like the depiction of like the first time when he goes to the police station and how like unseriously they take mm. his claims do you know what i mean there's yeah. like what are you talking about like oh so you messaged her like why did you give her your number then or like what like just like really weird lines of questioning rather than being like oh my gosh this person's experiencing trouble but we struggle to see men as victims because our construct of them is that they are victors so then yeah. it doesn't it's, it's not an easy transition to make but i think yeah we've got to do a lot of reimagining of like 
number one, what's possible, but also like the structures and systems around how we make those possibilities an actual option for people. Mm. Um, and like, rather than it just being like, well, now being a man is about being emotionally vulnerable and being like, now if you're, if you're not emotionally literate, now you're not a good man. Like rather than like just flipping it on its head, like also how do we support men um, into those ways of being? Because men don't, aren't socialized to be supported. We're not socialized mm. to like want support or want help. So it's a whole spider's web of like complicated things. But I do think the only way through is through, you know, like the only way mm. to get to the other side is to like actually walk through it and like unpack all of it and like think about every element of it and why it's the way it is and whether we like it and how we change it for ourselves. Um, and then we get to like on the other side of that build communities where we're able to, do those things and express those things in ways that are healthy and ways that are like rewarded rather than like stigmatized. And, and I think we've seen that over the last decade with like the mental health conversation, right? Like where we've seen the change in like, um, services that are available and like men's willingness to take up those services and like policies. And like, I think actually that kind of cultural change happens on so many different levels. Um, so as an organization, like I know for us, we see ourselves functioning like really strongly on that education um, and exploration level. And then there's other work that has to be done on a policy level. Um, and there's other work that has to be done on institutional levels. And like, there's other places where, we have to like in media and entertainment, we have to start telling new stories about what it means to be a man. And we have to start writing new fairy tales about like <laughs> that. We read bedtime stories that we read to the kids. Do you know what I mean? About that show different versions of masculinity. Otherwise we're going to be stuck here for a really long time. And the place that we're stuck is like, just not, not number one, like not a healthy place for us as men. Like it's a, a place where, we're more likely to be the people that end our own lives rather than any other threat that exists outside of us. Um, but it's also a place that means that everybody around us is less safe as well. Um, mm. And we don't know how to protect against those kinds of things. Last thing, I heard a really interesting thing around um, rites of passage when I was doing some work with um, the man cave in Australia. And mm. uh, 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 their he was talking about this idea that um, when it comes to rites of passage, he was talking about the Maasai and he was saying the rite of passage for the Maasai used to be to go out into the um, wilderness and like kill a lion. And they a group of them would go out and they had to bring back the, the body or the head of a lion to say, we've done it. We're men. We can protect the village from lions. But as time has gone on, that rite of passage has changed to now they're, rite of passage is protecting a lion from a poacher mm. um, because, because the threat has changed. And I think for us as men, we're maybe a little bit slow on the uptake that the threat has changed. Do you know what I mean? So we, we think we're still living in a world where the threat is that we can't be the provider, but women can provide. So mm. <laughs> like with lots of women are able and in positions to provide for themselves. So maybe that's not the primary concern. Maybe now the primary concern for us is like how we label and in like, uh, identify and deal with mental health issues um, mm. or or mental well-being or express or share emotion because if the leading killer for men is suicide then maybe the, the leading threat is not that we need to be dominant over other men maybe it's we need to learn how to control our internal worlds or like navigate our internal worlds in ways that are more healthy for us and help us to like stave off that kind of threat and i think actually it's like those kind of reimaginings that like um put us in in good stead do you know what i mean leave us in a position where we can kind of grab the ball by the horns and and tackle because i think it doesn't have to be that like we throw the baby out with the bathwater and like the whole of masculinity is trash and we need to just get rid of it but actually it's like how do we reimagine this thing in a way that like works for all of us in the world that we actually live in today. So that's really powerful though, to look at the the shift of threat. You know, I'd never thought of it in that way. The shift of threat is no longer, we need to dominate our environment or the people around us to keep us safe from other men that will come and take from our, you know, right. hordes that will take from our village or, or community is the thing that actually is a threat is an internal thing. And we need to, it reminds me of things I've written and also uh, read about, you know, like our, our greatest enemy is, is, is our internal world, our internal narrative, our internal voices. Mm. And if we don't ever learn to 
come to peace with um, um it's not it's you could argue it's a battle but like in a very buddhist sense it's like how can we tame this inner voice how can we become friends with this inner voice this inner narrative this inner way of which we talk to ourselves and how it often talks to ourselves is through emotions then we will never mm. find peace we can search mm. for peace outside of us through money and women and things and and houses and stuff but if we don't find this peace internally then it will never really materialize so and like linking that to what you said it's like actually the new rites of passage for a man is to learn to cultivate peace of his own feelings and emotions and stories so that he can be with that even when things are coming from the outside that he can bring peace to himself he can be in alignment with with something greater than um warring and and, and stress and strife mm, yeah and I, and i do think it's like i mean specifically for our context like in the UK today, that's the reality that we're dealing with. Do you know what I mean, and it might be that we go to war in a couple of years and the reality that we're dealing with changes and therefore masculinity changes and moulds and we have different threats that we have to face off against and we have to learn different ways of looking after ourselves and our communities. But I do think, like, right now today, um, the that internal world, and I think even the language we use around, like, I think I said, taking the ball by the horns, um, which is like such an aggressive imagery. Do you know what I mean? Whereas actually that language of like coming to peace with our internal worlds is like, or finding peace inside of ourselves mm. is actually like a, a beautiful way of describing it. Cause that's what, I, that's what it actually is. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't always have to be a fight or a battle or overcoming or like ch or challenge and like war. It, sometimes it's just learning to relax, <laughs> like learning, <laughs> learning to like be okay and like communicate when you're not okay. And that's healthy and that's good. Um, but I think the other issue that the other like battle we're going to have a <laughs> battle, the other issue we're going to have over the next couple of years is like how we market that to men at, at large. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I think that's the other thing is like for, um, lots of men, these ideas and these images are not images or ideas that resonate with them. And mm. they feel diametrically opposed to who they've been taught they need to be or who they feel they need to be in order to like navigate and survive the world. Um, but I do think, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of conversation. Like I never, I, I think I always feel like we never really talk about class and like how um, masculinities have been defined by, class in such strong ways and like the, a, a working class uh, a working man's masculinity is so physical and so like aggressive and so dominant and whereas like a, a upper class man's masculinity is so distinguished and gentlemanly and like mm. educated and put together and I, th I always think that that's like a weird d dichotomy that we never really look into and actually like when people have more resources the things that they have like the options that they have are like more towards that like self-actualization and more towards that like finding peace and being okay and like being able to like uh have status and rapport whereas when they don't have that security like it's a lot more about fighting and staying alive and all of those kinds of things um and so i think it's yeah how do we meet meet men where they are with these messages. Like, I think sometimes one of the things I learned early on is like, I can't just walk into every room and say the exact same thing because everybody relates to it very differently. Do you know what I mean? And and, it, and then you realise it's not even about what I say. It's about how I allow them to express what's going on for them. Um, but there was, I remember doing some work with um, some groundskeepers in Folkestone and um, them talking about like, that same narrative that you were talking about around peace, like them talking about fishing um, mm. as like the place where they, they, they're able to connect with themselves and able to connect with the guys around them and like able to like relax and let go of like all of the stress that they're feeling. And they weren't using that language, but like th th that importance for those guys of like still having a space and still having a way of like disconnecting from like all of the expectations that are placed on them and just a place where they can like think and meditate and like be calm and be at peace is so important so like how do we create those spaces or give men the, the ability to create those spaces for themselves i think is really important mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's a really important piece there you say about us finding individually where do we where do we find peace where do we have um where do we find contentment because i imagine yeah. the men who are up the social ladder and the upper classes have much more 
options to do that. You know, they have much more um, ways in their life where they find peace. Whereas if you start to move down the social ladder, you may find that the the men of the lower rungs that like what brings them peace might not be that healthy for them in the the longer term potentially sometimes or that they don't have anywhere that have any ways to create peace for themselves mm. yeah and the same as food right like when you look at what foods are available to people based on their geographic location and class it's no coincidence that like the poorest people are getting the worst food <laughs> and, mm. and the richest people have options, all of the options they could possibly imagine. And sometimes maybe even a chef who will cook it for them. So I think like actually viewing this in that same way of thinking like what, how do we broaden people's options? But I think that that's not just like, that's where this work moves beyond just a conversation. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think actually that's about building infrastructure and providing people with new opportunities and new spaces. And like, when we think about like, um, the climate crisis, what does just transition look like in terms of careers, like in, in countries where men still are the bread breadwinners and it, the economy relies on those men going to work. And now maybe they don't need to go to work in those same ways or the work that they were once doing is no longer viable because we've moved away from mining or we've moved like all of those kinds of conversations like how do we transition those men through in a way where they get to choose for themselves and they still have dignity and options i think yeah super important i'm I, this is a bit of a tangent but super important um, yeah i thought you know it's a good place maybe to come to an end and i imagine that the listeners are excited to where they can hear more from you how can they bring their your organization into their organization or their workplace or to their school like how do people find out more hear more from you work with you um so if you want to find out more you can hit us up at www.beyondequality.org um i think across socials will beyond underscore equality um across everything um, and just drop us a line, man. Shoot us a message. Shoot us an email. Um, we've got a bunch of brochures for like workplaces, schools, universities, sports teams, all of that kind of stuff. So if there's anything that you've heard that interests you or there's like a group of guys that you think you want to work with or you want us to work with or really need some work or any of that kind of stuff, please do um, get in contact. And uh, if you want to find me specifically, um you can get me at the real Ben Hurst across all socials again. Um, and yeah, same thing. Shoot me, shoot me a message, drop me a line um, and we can chat. Uh, but no, there's no buts. That's it. Just drop me a line. Um, yeah. Contact us anytime. We're more than happy to chat. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, this is the sort of conversation that you probably know someone you could bring this to. You could send this, this podcast to you and, or listen to mm. with someone, you know, a friend of yours on a car journey, a partner of yours on a, on a hike or whatever it may be to open up a conversation in your own life, right? To start to have these conversations about masculinity and what it means and how can we raise young boys into better men. And, and even maybe you have your own children as a conversations that you can start to have with them to so go forth and, and and, and do that but I think that's it from us um I almost lost a word for some reason um but yeah I'll let you wrap up but are we gonna wrap up and um all that's left for me to say is you know ciao ciao and have a wonderful day I want to say a big thank you for listening you know it's people like yourself that really help get the podcast out into the world you know, especially if you're often sharing the episodes and the podcast with people that you, th you feel just could do of listening, right? Can see a different way of being a man, maybe a different way of having dating lives and intimacy and relationships. So I want to say a big thank you. And if maybe after listening to this episode, you think, oh, there's someone actually who could really do with this, please share it with them, you know, share the love. I'm really, really grateful. And if, you know, you want to get in contact with me for any questions, or you want to talk about coaching or any working together, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at theauthenticman underscore, or you can email me hello at theauthenticman.net. Thank you very much. <laughs>